Hello and welcome to your favorite Indian television show. Of course, it's Aussie Indian. Thanks for your company. Hope you have been enjoying all the local community news, the news from India as well as Bollywood gossip and Indian fashion we bring on our show. Thanks to our media partner, we are able to bring all these uh, fantastic video clips from India. Well, in this show, we are talking about a very serious issue. It's called the human trafficking. If you think that the slave trading has ended in this world, think again. It is still happening in some of the developing countries, including India, and one brave woman called Anita Kanhaya has taken this head on. And uh, she has started a project called Freedom India Project, and she is the founder director. And we are going to bring you an exclusive interview with Anita in segment one. In segment two, we are going to bring you all the new release Bollywood movies as well as some breaking news from India. And in segment three, as we usually do, we bring you some colorful and glamorous Indian fashion. Now let's get straight into the show. As I mentioned before, human trafficking is still a very big problem around the world, including India. Many of these criminals who are engaging in this kind of activity are uh, still going ahead with their uh, business uh, as usual. And one woman, Anita Kanhaya, has taken this issue head on. And uh, she has started a project uh, called Freedom Project India to expose these criminals. And uh, Anita agreed to talk to a staff reporter, Ursula Melham. Let's take a look at part one of that interview with Anita. And today I am joined by the incredible founder and director of the Freedom Project India. It's Anita Kanaya. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and meet with us on Aussie Indian. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So Anita has flown all the way from India to come and talk about the works, about the projects and the good work that it does, as well as share some insight as to how we can all get involved uh, into impacting the lives of young women and children uh, in India. And now, can you please talk to us about what the general uh, issue and what is the core of human trafficking? Um, so human trafficking is, um, as the word signifies, the sale of human beings, um, which is incredible to think of in this day and age where um, we believe that slavery has been abolished, but it's reinvented itself in the form of human trafficking. And India is one of the um, source and destination countries which ranks among the top three um, for people being trafficked to and from. Um, when we say human trafficking, uh, it's difficult to understand when you haven't really seen it, but it's women and children mostly who are vulnerable to this and um, who have been, um, you know, sold into this. And um, the conditions, deplorable conditions, um, whether it's being sold for labor or whether it's being sold for commercial sex, um, they are cooped up in places. I've um, seen a girl who was uh, put in a dog cage and you know just kept there um, to break her will um, so that they could abuse her and she was only about 11 um, so if it's that or if it's factories where yeah. children have been kind of herded into and they work 14 hours they sleep there they work there so really deplorable conditions something they never agreed for yeah. and have been forced into or coerced into um, that's really what human trafficking is okay and Anita, as a loud and active voice um, for the poor and the oppressed women and children of India, what is the biggest issue right now? I know that the Freedom Project is a not-for-profit organisation to end slavery uh, and empower communities. What is the number one priority for you right now? Well, I think, um, you know, there are a few priorities, um, but to end slavery, it really will require all of us working together, yeah. uh, considering the fact that human trafficking is... Um, I think in India, the number one social issue, um, the ease with which human beings are bought and sold and the apathy um, that exists simply because it still doesn't concern me. Yeah. You know, it's still out there. Um, a lot of people still believe it's very rural based and it's, um, you know, um, involving more illiterate people than literate. But the truth and the reality is that it's crawled in to our backyards. And if we don't do something about it, um, you know, raising an awareness, that's why I'm here. And exactly. that's why, yeah. uh, you know, we're doing this talk is really to create that awareness that uh, we need to talk about it. Yeah. We need the word out there. 
uh, we need to be able to convey that message to people in vulnerable situations. Uh, what are they looking out for? Yes. Um, what should they be careful about? And so um, I think that's our number one priority is to put the message out there and to prevent it. Because we do do rescues and we do rehabilitate victims and survivors of trafficking. Yeah. But that makes it so difficult to work with them because of the trauma that they've endured during yeah. that time. So if we can um, build the next generation, the youth, to really do something about this, spread the awareness, social media, um, you know, hold um, even home um, events to be able to create that awareness among friends and um, colleagues in workspaces yeah. um, to talk about it. Yeah, well, it's going to make a change. Yeah, definitely no excuses in this day and age. And it all started for you one night 14 years ago. Can you tell our viewers about that night? Yeah, um, so about the time that you're talking about, I had just had my first um, baby girl. Oh. And she was, I think, about two years old. And I had a phone call this um, night, and it was late in the night. Mm -hmm. I was in Bangalore, in India, and um, I had this call from a friend who was working in this um, line, a lawyer. And he called and said, there are these two girls who have managed to escape from their trafficker and are hiding in a public phone booth um, in the bus stand, Bangalore bus stand. Um, please, can you go and um, just pick them up and bring them home? and somebody else will um, come and collect them. I wasn't going to do that simply because 10 o'clock at night and anyone who knows um, India or Bangalore will realize, um, you know, that's not a place you want to go to. Yeah. Um, and, you know, 14 years back, it was um, worse than it is today. But uh, he said I'll, he'll call back in 15 minutes. And, you know, we didn't have mobile phones then. Yeah. So it was a landline. And 15 minutes later, he called and he said, you know, in these 15 minutes, I've tried other people, but there isn't anyone who is willing to go. So will you please do it? And even though, you know, good sense told me not to do it, I ended up going that night. And we went to the bus stand and we managed to find these girls. They had hidden behind the telephone booth. And we picked them up and I brought them home and I was never the same. They were 11 and 12 years old and I heard their stories, I saw firsthand what had happened, I heard them describe the pain and the trauma of um, you know the places that they were held in and I saw marks. You know one of the girls had a mark across her back, she was beaten with a steel chain and locked up in a in a dog cage and I just I just couldn't stay quiet about it anymore. Wow. And since then, you and your team have um, done tireless work and you guys have performed countless of rescue missions. Uh, more than 400 is the number of rescue missions that you and your team have performed to help rescue these young women and children. Uh, could you speak to some of those rescue missions and what other associated risks? Yeah. So when we um, talk about a rescue, for those who yeah. really don't know what happens, um, most times we have to build the entire investigation yeah. around the case because um, the police in India have a lot of priorities uh, for other things like law and order is a problem, terrorism is a problem. So uh, human trafficking kind of takes a back seat on this but because we are so concerned about these um, the vulnerabilities of the women and yeah. children especially and the fact that the longer they stay in these places the more difficult it is for us to rehabilitate them we have built a team of investigators who double up as clients who will um, go in as um, you know sometimes pose as pimps just oh. to be able to get the information oh, yeah. um, you know they're undercover yeah, but that's the only way we yeah. can get the information. Where are these women and children being held? How are they being brought? How do we infiltrate this place? Yes. What are the escape routes if we're going in? So we map the entire place. Um, and now with technology, we geotag and, you know, we have all of that information ready before we go to the police yeah. with this. And we're able to... Um, tell them exactly how the inside looks like yeah. and um, the number of people inside. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we have real stories, That's you know, incredible. where the girls are able to talk 
yeah. to the um, to the men thinking their clients but very often they'll say please can you help me out yes I have a number I'm from this place I just want to escape this yeah it's amazing so yeah as I understand you work with a lot of uh, you know women who are in a beggary syndicate um, you free babies from supposed orphanages who sell them out or hire them out to mothers for begging purposes and the list goes on this mm -hmm. must be uh, very frightening um, have you grown some thick skin over the time or, or, or do these stories and do these issues still um, affect you as much as they did that one night 14 years ago um, I'd like to say that I have grown some thick skin but no um, I think um, I'm just as um, vulnerable and just as moved and um, just as affected yeah as I was um, those many years ago um, especially when it comes to babies. Uh, we've had cases uh, where women have um, hired babies. It's very easy to hire babies yeah. for as less as a dollar a day. Um, you oh, can hire them, but okay. they make three times that amount easily in half a day. So any one of us could easily be enabling this behavior yes. and this general attitude. Yes. And, and you recently, so you obviously have done a lot of work with child beggary, but you also recently co-authored a book uh, on this issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so I co-authored the book with one of the top police officers at that time um, with a government official who was the chairperson of the Child Welfare Committee and with a lawyer. So myself and three others we co-authored the only book on children begging, forced to beg and its relationship to trafficking yeah. which hadn't been looked at before because you take it for granted that when the children are very young and you see them with an adult you believe that that adult and that child are related yeah but um, the book was the result of a uh, operation that we did in the city of Bangalore in 2011 in December um, and we rescued 300 children wow. who were aged under 10 300 children it was on national news it was on CNN uh, IBN breakfast news and if I, you know, if I may share a really moving story Please. from that. Um, so there was a, because it was on breakfast news, there was a father who turned up from West Bengal. And he had seen this on news. And he had been told by family members that, um, you know, there, there are 300 children who've been found. Maybe you'll find your son. And so he caught a train and he came to Bangalore um, looking for his son who had gone missing four years ago. And the child was playing outside the house in West Bengal and was just picked up and taken away. So in the hope that he'll find his son, he came all the way to Bangalore. I met him and we sat down with him and we had before the operation began, three months before that, we had photographed every single child on the street. So when I said we, it was um, a partnership operation done with non-government organizations okay. with the police with the department of women and child welfare in the um, state of karnataka in the city of bangalore and so we had all this documentation available so we personally sat down and went through all of those thousand photographs with him and sadly he came with a picture a small picture of his son when he was two and a half years old um, so he didn't even have a current picture of his kid. Yeah. And that's the story of most people in the villages. Yeah. You know, you don't have um, identification documents. Yeah. It's gotten better now. But, you know, this is um, talking about 2011. And so he had this picture and the police were able to age the photograph. And he they matched it with one of the pictures that we had taken. And I remember this because I was there when that picture was taken. Um, so that there was a child who was, um, you know, beating a drum, quite a common sight in India where you perform tricks on the road and then you beg for money after that. So there was a girl who was beating a drum and then there was this little boy who had a school uniform on, but he was obviously not in school, must have been donated, yeah. you know, given away as a secondhand um, piece of clothing. But th that was how the photograph was. Yeah. Heartbreaking as it was, uh, we don't always have success stories in this. And I, I can completely imagine that and it would be heartbreaking, but you do the best that you do. Um, and as well, I understand that you work um, in outreach uh, in identifying women 
who are or who could be victims of the sex trade. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, I can't even begin to imagine that that would be a very sensitive um, issue. It would be very, you know, um, hard to work with. How, how do you deal with that? Well, um, to understand that, you've got to understand a little bit about the Indian culture and how, yeah. um, you know, it's quite sexually repressed. So there isn't overt, um, you know, show of affection. Um, women dress quite modestly. Things have yeah. changed um, now with the younger generation. But, um, you know, the reason that women and children are so vulnerable to this is because um, somehow the girl child, you know, because of gender discrimination has always learned to take authority from the male you know so whether it's your father whether it's your brother whether it's your husband you know you you tend to respect and um, so therefore they the abuse of that power um, you know yes. when when mm. when the uh, man does the trafficking um, it's it's difficult for them to come out of it so when I say you know does the trafficking these women are taken often kidnapped, duped, drugged, yes. um, and then transported in that state. So they are unaware of um, where they are, where they've been brought to. Um, and when we talk about trafficking, the important thing is that they never keep them in the geographical location that they're from. And in India, every state speaks a different language. You know, the, the unifying languages are quite, um, just a few. And yeah. even in the south where we have four different states, all four different states speak a different language. Yeah. So when they transport them to another place, you don't know the language. And so it makes it difficult to communicate. They also keep them um, under threat. So there's a lot of threat, even though they, they service a number of customers. And let me tell you that on an ordinary day, a girl in a brothel has to see a minimum of 10 customers on an ordinary day. So on festival days, on days where, you know, you have holidays, which is very often in India, um, a woman sees up to 40 customers. I actually have um, pictures that we've taken from rescue operations of their book of accounts. And you can see the girl's name and you can see the number of customers that she has entertained with the amount of money that's been paid by each customer for the girl. So. It's amazing um, that you are able to enable this platform to empower these communities and, and these people. Um, and you've spoken briefly about the work um, that's been done in the state of Karnataka, um, as well as India um, more generally. How can our viewers, or what can we tell our viewers about different ways to get involved? What can they do to make an impact in bettering the lives of, of these uh, young and oppressed uh, people in India? Yeah, um, so I have mentioned a little bit about our work um, yeah. in Karnataka, but um, what I would like to say is that many of the women that we have rescued, that we have in our home, are not from the state of Karnataka. Okay. Um, like I said, yes. we always traffic from another place, of course, yeah. and the options to go back home aren't there. Yeah. Um, one of it is the shame. The other is the fact that a lot of times family members or community people have been involved yeah. in them being sold. So they don't want to go back, which means that then we have to create a family or an atmosphere of a community around them okay. so they can feel whole again. They can go back to being um, on their feet um, in sustainable employment. So one of the ways that we would love uh, for people to be involved and where you can be involved is really to um, support the work um, financially. Uh, you could volunteer. If you um, do come down to India or even um, in Australia, the Freedom Project does have an office and you can be part of um, volunteering with them. Um, you can, um, you know, in any way um, come down and um, do some training with us. We have started a social enterprise which is called the Heart of Baking, okay. which is a baking initiative um, for these women. We've set up a women's cooperative. And we've taught them baking and now they are making um, fruit based mini cupcakes, um, bread rolls and we're marketing that with schools Lovely. and colleges. Great. So that's their way of partnering with us yeah. in providing um, employment opportunities for these women. Okay. So if you know baking and would love to come down and take a class or two, that's an opportunity as well. Okay. Um, you could hold Freedom Evenings and talk about this issue. Yeah. Because it's not just based in India. Um, human trafficking is a global concern. 
and if you would um, love to host a freedom evening we've got that we can hand out um, you can just have a discussion you could um, you know raise some support for that and just be empowered um, and aware because the more aware we are the more the information gets spread the more likely we are to notice a victim of trafficking or to be involved in supporting the work okay um, and as well as that um, what work does the Freedom Project India back to the project specifically what work do they do with government agencies in India just looking at it um, on a very broad scale uh, are there any initiatives to really push this forward yeah um, so all of the work that we do is in partnership with government agencies because without law enforcement we can't do a rescue operation of without course. yeah without yeah. a license yeah. to run a home which is a government license we can't yeah. run a safe house so we do partner with the government um, we work quite closely with them um, both for rescue operations as well as for um, rehabilitation of survivors okay. i myself um, am on a state high powered committee to address human trafficking in the state of Karnataka. Um, I do do a lot of training with law enforcement okay. uh, because many of them have not really seen the inside yes. of these brothels. So we do police training, um, we train with government officials as well um, and I am currently doing a social audit for the government on the state of the homes Great. and how we can improve them. Great work. Great. Well, thank you so much, Anita, um, for coming to speak with us about this very important... Hope you got an idea of the seriousness of the problem of uh, human trafficking in India. And uh, hats off to this uh, lady, Anita Kanhaya, who has done a fantastic job in starting this project. If you can help in any way, please do so. All the details are at the bottom of the screen and uh, jump on that website to get more details.